Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott and I'm here today to give you my definitive review of the Canon RF 600mm F11 IS STM. Canon has always struck me as being a fairly conservative company and throughout the, their long history at this point, while they have had some major innovations, Canon tends to be a little bit more conservative in the way that they approach design, quite traditional in a lot of ways. But it seems like the transition to the RF uh, mount in the EOS R mirrorless system has really unlocked some new creativity and maybe given them a little bit more capacity to take risk. And I don't think that there are any lenses on the new RF platform that are more evident of that than the RF 600 and RF 800 millimeter F11 prime lenses. First of all, it would have been impossible to release an F11 lens on the EF mount. The simple reality was is that almost all of the Canon bodies that were available simply couldn't autofocus at f11. So it would kind of be a non-starter uh, for a lens like this. However, a mirrorless has a, has a little bit more latitude, different types of focus systems, and so on. Uh, many of the Canon bodies, you have the capacity to focus at smaller maximum apertures, and so we have seen Canon creep a little bit. And even with the 100 to 500 uh, millimeter lens, that you know creeps from 4.5 to 7.1, whereas on the EF mount, the uh, 100 to 400 does that 4.5 but then terminates at f5.6. I do have to say for some of us that have been around for a while in the photography world, seeing apertures smaller than f5.6, particularly smaller than f6.3, which we were conditioned to, uh, you know, to expect a little bit from third parties like Canon, like Sigma and Tamron, but to see even smaller maximum apertures is a little bit hard to swallow. But f11 that's in a whole new category and it does raise some interesting uh, ramifications of the lens however it's pretty clear what what Canon was trying to do it was on their new platform trying to give people an affordable way to reach to very long focal lengths and in that measure both the RF 600 millimeter and the RF 800 millimeters are certainly successes because at their respective prices of around 700 and then 900 US dollars you're certainly not going to get that kind of reach anywhere else for that kind of price. And so in that way, it is a triumph, but there is certain realities that come with an F11 lens that I'll try to detail as a part of this review today. But first, I wanna thank the sponsor of today's episode, which is Phantom Wallets. Today's episode is brought to you by Phantom Wallet, the minimalist modern wallet that sets you free from the bulky traditional wallet while also making it easy to access your cards and money when you need them, thanks to their unique fanning mechanism. Visit phantomwallet.com to check out their unique sizes, styles, and finishes that span from aluminum to wood to carbon fiber. You can even customize your wallet with new accessories like a money clip, cash holder, ID display, and even the Chipolo tracking integration if you're the kind of person who loses their wallet. Use code DUSTIN15 for 15% off when you're ready to check out. So first we're going to take a look at the quite quirky design elements here and give you a closer hands-on look at the lens itself and raise a few discussion points in that episode. Let's take a look. So the RF 600 millimeter F11 certainly stands out as one of the quirkiest lenses along with the 800 millimeter that Canon has ever produced. It starts when you go to turn on the camera and the first thing that you're going to see is that it says set the lens to the shooting position. And so you realize that to operate the lens, you have to first rotate this locking ring, extend the lens out a significant and then relock that into place and you're then in the shooting position. The second thing that you're going to see is kind of a reversion to the old days and that rather than having a full sensor available of autofocus, you're reserved to this little square right here. And, and certainly I don't enjoy going back to that limiting, particularly when it comes to tracking objects. And that is because of the small maximum aperture of F11 here. Now, speaking of this lens being an F11 lens, you say, well, Dustin, of course it's an F11 lens. It's right in the name. But no, what's weird about this lens is it, it is literally 
literally only an f11 lens. Not only can you not open up the aperture larger than f11, you can't close it down smaller. There is no aperture iris. There are no aperture blades. That aperture is always wide open. You can only shoot this lens in f11. That makes it a very strange and unique lens in my experience. And so the quirks continue on that front. Some other interesting uh, parts of the design here is that you'll see that this portion up at the front, and it's even more pronounced on the 800 millimeter because that section is larger, that this front section beyond the control ring is actually has like a rubberized surface that is more like a camera grip maybe even more like binoculars than it is a traditional lens. Not something that I've seen before, uh, kind of a unique design on that. Because this is not an L-series lens, there is no lens hood that is included. There is no weather sealing in the lens. And Canon persists in having you know, quite a limited uh, you know, selection of accessories with its non-L-series lenses included in them. One of the more odd missing features here is that while there is a place for a tripod foot to be mounted, there is no tripod foot included. You're gonna to have to do that through a third party means, which means that you're kind of left without that of mounting the lens on uh, via the camera body itself if you're going to a tripod as I'm demonstrating here, which obviously leads to some balance related issues. And so in this case, because I have a small lightweight tripod for demonstration, I had to make sure that there is a foot going down here underneath the lens to keep the little tripod from tripping over. Kind of a weird aspect of the lens design, and that's true on the 800 millimeter as well. And it's just part of the way that Canon has kept the price down on these lenses. And of course, the overall lens itself is not particularly heavy. It weighs in at 930 grams, a little over two pounds, which is obviously quite lightweight for a lens like this. The lens is fairly compact for a 600 millimeter lens. It is 93 millimeters in diameter, which leaves you with a fairly common 82 millimeter filter thread up front. And the overall length is right under 270 millimeters. And so obviously that makes it an easier lens for transporting than the much longer 800 millimeter lens does. Now less quirky and more conventional are the other controls on the lens itself. The, although it's a different uh, finish here, more of a chrome finish, the control ring that is a you know hallmark of Canon RF design, it feels and operates like just about all the other control rings do, has that familiar diamond pattern type finish. The focus ring itself is wide, it's fairly nicely damped, it has a quality feel to it with a rubberized ribbed texture, texture there. And then there are three switches here, including a uh, just two position focus limiter, either the full or 12 meters to infinity, which if that seems fairly far away, know that that's because the lens itself can only focus as close as four and a half um, meters and gives it a quite a low, about 0.15 times magnification, which obviously most telephoto lenses will best, most notably a lot of the zoom lenses that reach up to 600 millimeters, many of which give you a higher magnification level than what this lens does. There is an AF-MF switch here, and then there is just a simple on and off for the stabilizer. Pretty much what you would expect in terms of basic controls here, and overall the lens itself is you know, primarily made of plastics, though there is a variety of different textures here, and that's part of how they keep the weight down. Now on the note of the image stabilizer, it is quite effective and does a good job, and I really notice it with a lens like this because such a small maximum aperture means that in most lighting conditions, you're gonna really struggle to get your shutter speed up. And if you don't want to utterly crank your ISO to achieve that, if you have a subject that's fairly stationary, you're going to be relying on that image stabilizer a whole lot more and fortunately it seems to be quite effective in operation though when it comes to any kind of movement or action there is no substitute for getting that shutter speed up which is somewhat hard to do here so overall a very quirky type design that is unique in anything that i have reviewed previously and so as you can see, a very unconventional design. And in many ways, it's a very uncanon type design because it does uh, assume a number of risk and uh, has some design elements that frankly, I've never seen in any other Canon lens before. Unfortunately, the negatives there, at least some of the negatives are Canon familiars and that is their insistence to not include a lens hood. And in this case, to have a, you know, a threading for a tripod uh, foot, a socket there for it, but to include no tripod foot in the bag 
no, it just seems like cheaping out once again. And so I am going to knock Canon on that once again, because at this stage, not including a lens hood, I mean, it seems like everyone else includes a lens hood with all of their lenses. And for Canon to persist in not doing that, you'll pay about 50 bucks uh, to pick up the optional lens hood for the lens. It just seems, you know, again, to, to be a, a very obvious cost cutting um, measure that's really not consistent with the industry standard at this point. Now, moving beyond some of those quirks, we're going to take a look at the autofocus performance. So let's talk about autofocus. In the 600 millimeter STM, STM stands for stepping motor. In this case, uh, Canon more specifically says it is a lead screw type uh, stepping motor. My experience with, with uh, Canon on the RF mount is that they basically have a couple of tiers of their autofocus motors and performance. And so STM tends to be their more consumer grade tier with nano USM often employed in you know, multiple motors working in their, their higher end lenses. And so in this case, though you have kind of the lower end autofocus system, it actually works quite well. What I noticed in terms of focus speed that differs from nano USM is that I did know just a split second of lag when you're making a focus change and so once focus begins it's very very fast and so focus changes occur quickly but there is a little bit of a momentary lag after you're you know putting input into the shutter before it actually starts to move and it, you're, it's only there you're only going to notice if you're actually paying attention for it but uh, you know obviously that is going to be a factor the other thing that's going to be at play here is that this is an f11 lens and so you have to be kind of prudent about the situations that you use it in. Maybe realistic is the right word to use. And so if you're shooting in low light conditions, there is no F11 lens that is going to perform well in those kinds of situations. It's just not designed for that. And the amount of light reaching the sensor is going to be limited by that aperture. And that aperture is always going to be F11. You're never going to get more light than that. And so that means that under less ideal lighting conditions, autofocus is going to, you know, to suffer as a result of that. So you just need to use this lens uh, to its strengths and not to its weaknesses. On a positive note that while I did find that, you know, tracking, um, you know, say a bird, for example, once you trying to acquire focus is always kind of the challenge. If you are someone that takes photos of wildlife or birds in flight, particularly with a long focal length like this. And so once you get it locked in, however, and of course you're working with that smaller square, which I did find a little bit frustrating, but I did find at the same time that once the camera was locked in, it did a surprisingly good job with this lens of, you know, keeping up with the bird in flight and tracking it along accurately as it went. Now with changing lighting conditions, you know, sometimes your shutter speed's going to drop and so you get some motion blur in there. That's a hard thing that you are going to have to learn with experience how to get the most out of the lens. But I did find that, you know, there was good accuracy. And then in more easy subjects, for example, this shot of Loki, um, even though you can either see him, you know, straight on or to the side, but even from the side view, you can see that uh, autofocus just locked on really nicely and so delivered a well-focused result. So overall, I found that autofocus was just fine if I use the lens in the conditions that it was created for. So don't go try going into a dimly lit hall, for example, or a stadium and trying to use this lens and expecting fantastic results. That's just not realistic. But if you're using it for outdoor sports, wildlife, birds in reasonable light, it does a pretty good job. Once you've acquired, it locks on and stays nicely locked on. It's just there is going to be just a, a moment's hesitation during that, that you know, moment when you're kind of hunting for. And, and as always, if you're shooting at more distant subjects and you know they're going to stay distant, use that focus limiter and that will help you a little bit further. But the, the challenge of using the focus limiter is that if your subject happens to come closer to you than what you expect, you're not going to be able to focus up close. So, you know, you have to be kind of confident that your subject is not going to move closer than 12 meters to you, you know, about 40 feet away. At the end of the day, this is not, you know, one of, this is not a super telephoto from Canon, you know, that costs $10,000. So you can't expect it to perform like one, but for a $700, 600 millimeter lens, focus is pretty good. 
And so obviously the, the big takeaway there is that you know autofocus is effective here. However, it is going to be constrained by the, the realities of physics. And the realities of physics dic dictate that if you are shooting in less than ideal lighting conditions, this is not a lens that is going to thrive in those kind of conditions. And so most certainly if you're in dim lighting conditions, this is a lens that is going to induce some struggle uh, for autofocus, even with the high-tech bodies like the EOS R5 or R6 and their very advanced focus systems. It's just the reality of a minimal amount of light that is reaching the sensor and so that's all that the you know the camera has to work with in terms of autofocus and so even lenses with uh, you know a larger maximum aperture than this in certain lighting conditions they struggle that's just going to be amplified when you're talking about a lens with an aperture of f11. Consider this a lens with a maximum aperture of f5.6 is two full stops uh, faster in light gathering than what this lens is. And every one of those stops means you get twice as much light gathering potential. Or in this case, in the negative, every one of those stops you go further uh, gives you, you know, half of the light gathering poten potential of the previous stop. And so what that means is that I've seen f5.6 lenses that struggle in certain lighting conditions, how much more so a lens with a maximum aperture of f11. Again, there are the reality of physics that kind of, you know, do limit the effectiveness of this lens in certain situations. Does that apply to the image quality as well? Well, let's dive in and let's take a look. So as the first party lens, the RF 600 millimeter is going to have good profile support, but we will take a quick look at vignette and distortion here. You can see that there is a mild amount of pin cushion distortion. I used a, a minus three to correct for that in the manual correction. And uh, as far as vignette, there is a moderate amount of vignette I used in the plus 43 range to bring that back up and to give us even illumination across the frame. In most situations, you're not going to have to do that manually because the profile will take care of it in camera and then if you're doing uh, corrections even in post software very likely there's going to be an automatic profile to correct for it. I found that chromatic aberrations were uh, well controlled with the lens. I saw no real issue with any of that and so you can see here in these areas of very high contrast that there's no evidence of any fringing and so in terms of real world shooting I didn't really see an issue with fringing. So my sharpness test is done on a 45 megapixel Canon EOS R5. And so obviously we have but one aperture to test. And so fortunately this lens does quite good at that. So we can see uh, in the center of the frame that they're rendering lots of detail. There is good contrast. And as we move off towards the side, you can see again, very, very strong in result, uh, very high resolution. And even moving down into the corners, we can see very good resolution there as well. Uh, moving into the upper corner, we see good evidence of centering. And if we take a peek down here, we can see that there is not really any evidence of lateral chromatic aberrations either. So overall, although we have a limited optical performance in terms of options, uh, we do have a very good optical performance here at f11. Now in the traditional moonshot here, even though, you know, I'm not really shooting at optimal conditions, this was handheld, but at the same time, you can see looking in on it that we've got good detail that is rendered there. And, you know, obviously you can see the craters on the moon quite well. And so it's a, a nice lens for this kind of application as well. Now, one thing you will have to watch out for with any kind of long telephoto lens, particularly on a hot summer humid day or other kind of weather conditions where you can have pockets of uh, air that are going to be rising that create an optical effect where it actually softens the image. And so we've already determined this is a very sharp lens, but you can see that as we look at this distance scene that it's almost uh, painterly in its look. And that is because of the various, you know, heat shimmers and uh, rising heat waves at the varying you know levels over the top of the water and then on the distant shore that are going to diminish that somewhat and that's not a defect of the lens that's just a reality to be aware of uh, in a lot of different shooting conditions when you're shooting with a long telephoto lens it is going to impact image sharpness and contrast now this shot of loki shows more ideal conditions and you can see here that that is a beautiful end result great sharpness and contrast 
lots of detail that is there and you can see that um, in you know good conditions like this that the background has become nice and creamy we'll take a look at another shot here and so this also kind of shows off how good that the eye detect is working and you can see that it grabbed on perfectly on the eye Canon is very good in their most recent bodies with uh, this technology and so you can just see it's a really beautiful effect and even though we've only got an aperture of f11 600 millimeters is a very long focal length and so if you're you know reasonably close to your subject you will actually end up with a very highly diffused background so as noted earlier maximum magnification is only 0.14 times so not particularly high however we can see very good detail this is at a one-to-one -one. before we, we were looking at a two-to-one level this is one-to-one -one level and so you can see that um, at a, a normal pixel level the resolution is just really really great and even off towards the side it's still consistently very good so as we saw earlier, eye detect is working very well also with birds. And in this case, you can see that there's good detail. Now, this is not mind-blowingly good here, but there's good detail um, on the subject of this bird. And you can see once again that the defocus background looks nice. Here's another shot that shows off, you know, a nicely defocused background, you know, good detail on the subject. And you can see that it's, you're certainly capable of producing some very professional looking images with the lens despite its quirks. The one challenge I will point out, just due to the nature of the lens, is that very often you're going to be shooting at higher ISO values. And so there's going to be very few situations where you actually get the peak performance of your camera's sensor. Also is the factor that this lens is having to fight against uh, the effects of diffraction. And so in the case of like my EOS R5, diffraction is setting in somewhere around f6 or so, which means that by the time you get to f11, you're never going to see the peak performance performance of the lens. And so despite these limitations, you know, shooting at higher ISO and, you know, working against diffraction, this lens is still quite sharp, all things considered. So if you're using it in the right conditions, it can produce some brilliantly nice images. There's going to be other situations, however, that it will frustrate you as we're seeing as a part of this review in general. So overall, this lens actually impresses me, and it's even more impressive when you consider on the EOS R5 that uh, diffraction, uh, the effects of diffraction start to set in at about f7.1, which means that in reality, we never see the full potential of this lens um, optically because of the limits of diffraction and how it affects high resolution bodies. And so, uh, you know, the fact that it's doing as good as what it does under those constraints shows that this really is once again an impressive bit of glass from Canon. But I also have to point out again the reality of real world shooting in that you're going to rarely see the kind of superb image quality that we saw in my static test out in the real world. Why? Well, because of being able to shoot off of a tripod with a 10 second delay, I was able to not really care much about shutter speed and just shoot at ISO 100 and get a very crisp, as you could see, in result. Out in the real world, I'm not really going to be able to do that. I have to keep my shutter speed up and so that I can stop any kind of movement of either the camera or if I have to stop the action of my subject, I have to get the shutter speed even higher, which means that the ISO is going to climb accordingly, which means that I'm getting out of peak performance. And so I'm rarely going to be in a situation where I get to shoot at ISO 100 and get the full benefit of, you know, a low ISO setting and thus the full dynamic range and, and sharpness and low noise potential of my camera sensor. And so the byproduct is, is that while real, res real world results are good, they're not as good. You know, for example, when I was shooting, you know, uh, bird photography, for example, in that setting, you know, I could see the effects of having to shoot at ISO 3200 or ISO 6400. There's just more noise, a little bit less sharpness. And obviously that's going to be the real world factor that does limit the performance of what is, you know, taken in a, a vacuum, a very good lens optically. And so that's the reality that you have to face with these lenses. They do give you the ability at a very low price point and a very lightweight uh, price point to get 600 millimeters of, of reach, which is wonderful. And I really appreciate that that exists, but you have to use the lens within its strengths and recognize there are going to be some serious real world uh, limitations to getting maximum performance out of this lens. So that kind of puts, if you, you know, acquire this lens, it just puts a little bit more of a burden on you to learn how to get the most out of it um, in your own shooting situation. And I think for those of you that are on a constrained budget and like the concept 
concept of a very compact lens that gives you that kind of reach, you might be willing to you know, assume the risk that come with that. And if so, invest a little bit of time, learn how to get the best results you can out of it. And I do think you can be rewarded some, with some really nice looking images at an incredible price point for the lens. So at the end of the day, I'm glad that the RF 600 millimeter F11 IS STM exists. If nothing more, to give us more options on how we achieve that kind of reach. And it's worth noting that you know the alternative, the 600 millimeter uh, F4 L lens, it retails at about thirteen thousand dollars. So you could buy about eighteen of these for the uh, the price of that lens. That's something worth considering. I'm Dustin Abbott, and if you'll look in the description down below, you can find linkage to my full text review, also to the image gallery. There's linkage there where you can purchase my merchandise, uh, follow me on social media, become a patron, sign up for my newsletter, and of course, if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Thanks for watching, have a great day, and let the light in.